now on the History Channel. Stories from the pages of time. Stories of triumph and tragedy, adventure and achievement as we go in search of history. Dracula, a name that inspires horror and fear. A bloodthirsty murderer immortalized in fiction and in film. The incredible legends of the vampire, passed along in folklore, myths, and Irish author Bram Stoker's best-selling novel, Dracula, did have a human inspiration. A 15th century Romanian prince called Vlad the Impaler. His story and more as we go in search of history for the real Dracula. Since it was first published in 1897, Bram Stoker's Dracula has become one of the world's most popular and frightening works of fiction. This best-selling horror novel has scared up enough sales to keep it continuously in print for more than 100 years. Dracula has continued to fascinate readers with its indelible image of evil, the myth of the vampire personified. I am Dracula. The visual perception of Dracula owes much to Bela Lugosi's suave, well-tailored portrayal of the character in the 1931 movie version. But Stoker's Prince of Darkness is an even more frightening figure, a demon with razor-sharp teeth and grotesque, pointed features. Dracula is a vampire, a dead man who must consume the blood of the living to survive and in doing so, recruits them to his ranks of the undead. A monster with the blood of hundreds of victims coursing through his veins is a powerful character indeed. But Dracula's ultimate strength lies in the history invested in him. A history Bram Stoker forged by combining thousands of years of vampire folklore, old world superstitions, and historical fact in the person of a savage 15th century Romanian tyrant known as Vlad the Impaler. And perhaps as important, Stoker brought his own haunted life and the Victorian times he lived into the creative mix. It may have been Bram Stoker's destiny to write Dracula. He was haunted by death from the day he was born, November 8, 1847, in a town not far from Dublin. It was the height of the Great Irish Potato Famine. During the 1840s, out of Ireland's population of eight million, more than a million and a half died of starvation and disease. Those who did not die wandered the streets, looking like the walking dead. Stoker was born in this comfortable middle-class house in Clontarf. Though he was aware of the suffering outside, it would be some time before he could see it with his own eyes. He was virtually a prisoner in this house for the first seven years of his life, bedridden with a mysterious disease that left him paralyzed. Every day, his mother told him about the troubled outside world along with tales of the supernatural and horror stories from her own childhood. Stoker was a very sickly child in his early years, and his mother told him terrifying stories, part, part of the time about fairies, at other times about this terrible cholera plague in Sligo when people were buried alive. And this must have worked on his fevered imagination. At the age of seven, Stoker miraculously recovered. He was finally free to play in the neighborhood graveyard. Beside him where he lived, there was a suicide graveyard. It was a plot specifically put aside for burying people who committed suicides. Stoker is known to have spent hours and hours 
endless hours playing, mesmerised in that graveyard. And it may have been a reason why he, he got this concept of the undead that these people are still wandering. As Stoker grew into an adult, he seemed to put his deathly preoccupation behind him. He attended college and took a job as a civil servant. In 1878, he married, moved to London, and worked as the theater manager for renowned stage actor Henry Irving. Stoker loved the theater, but he had an even greater passion, writing. Stoker mainly wrote tales of romantic adventure, but he was quite taken with the fantastic. In 1882, he published Under the Sunset, a collection of horror stories for children. One story involved a plague that took the form of a shadowy giant. Another, about a character called the King of Death. At the time, only a handful of vampire stories had been written, like Varney the Vampire, an 1847 British magazine serial. But what caught Stoker's attention was a book published in 1872. He had been impressed by the work of another fellow Irishman, Sheridan Luffin, who wrote a novel called Carmilla, about a female vampire. So he wanted to write a vampire story. So what happened is he started out by looking into vampire folklore. This was the birth of Dracula. In the spring of 1890, Stoker began a meticulous process of vampire research that would take him to libraries from England to Ireland and would span seven years. As he got underway, Stoker made an important decision. While his novel would be based on folklore, it would also be contemporary. His book would employ modern inventions like the typewriter and the dictaphone. Dracula would be a product of a society in transition. In the Western world, the arts and literature were beginning to break free of their classical roots, becoming forms of expression that appealed to more impulsive sensations. This transformation was especially true in Stoker's England. These were Victorian times, named for the rigid monarch who ruled Great Britain in the latter half of the 19th century. It was an era when behavior and morality were expected to be as restrained as the queen herself. But a new form of fiction was becoming increasingly popular with the British public, the Gothic novel. For Stoker's horror story, the style was a perfect fit. He tantalized readers with emotionally charged action and supernatural exotic settings. Sexuality could only be suggested indirectly, like a bite on the neck. Because he couldn't write about sexuality as we do today, more overtly, that this was kind of subterfuge, that the biting on the neck was just a metaphor for the sexual act. And it's much more romantic than just writing about the sexual act. But while Dracula would have his way with women, he would be far from a ladies' man. Stoker's Dracula was not a romantic character. He was a hideous old man who got younger as he drank blood, but he never became attractive. And he never wasted any time uh, seducing uh, any of his victims. I mean, his idea of a social call was, you know, crashing through your bedroom window in the form of a wolf. <laughs> During that time in England, the origin of man was hotly debated. Charles Darwin's Descent of Man, the cornerstone of evolutionary thinking, had recently been published. Stoker wrote during the time when Darwin's theories were really upsetting the Victorian consciousness, and Dracula was a kind of a horrible evolutionary backsliding character who could crawl down the evolutionary ladder to become a bat or a wolf. I mean, he blurred the distinctions between men and animals. 
Dracula was also likely inspired by men who acted like animals. In the fall of 1888, just two years before he began researching Dracula, the newspapers were filled with stories of Jack the Ripper. This mysterious killer savagely attacked young women on the foggy streets of London's East End and struck only at night. For the next seven years, Bram Stoker would read many more horror stories. In writing Dracula, he would dig up hundreds of vampire myths and legends. When In Search of History returns, we'll discover what Bram Stoker unearthed. From the tale of the vampire who attacked Adam to the account of a 17th century woman who murdered hundreds of young girls in order to bathe in their blood. In the pages of Dracula, the vampire hunter, Dr. Van Helsing, talks about the history of vampires. Oh, let me tell you, it is known everywhere that men have been, in old Greece, in old Rome, in France, in India, and in China. This is what Bram Stoker discovered during the seven years of research that went into the creation of Dracula. Vampire myths and legends from almost every time and place in history. There's no civilization that hasn't had some variation on the idea of the vampire or the being that comes back from the grave to feed on the energy or the blood of, of, of living people. Vampire stories can be traced back to creation itself. According to some Hebrew scholars, the world's first man was haunted by the world's first vampire. She was Adam's wife, Lilith. In the Talmud, the book of Jewish laws, Adam had a wife before Eve named Lilith. Lilith challenged Adam's authority in their marriage, seeing herself as his equal. Adam wanted to be on top while they were having sex. And she said, no way in the world. If we're equal, then we're both on top. And of course, that was in his mind uh, a rebellion and a, an abomination, and he refused to accept that. And Lilith and Adam argued for a while. And when she realized she was not going to get her way, according again to Jewish folklore, uh, she took off. Banishing herself to the shores of the Red Sea, she later returned as a demon who possessed vampiric powers. She attacked Adam, his new wife Eve, and their children. In Greek mythology came a similar tale of a female vampire. The Lamia was a Libyan queen who had several children with Zeus, king of the Greek gods. After they were confiscated by Hera, Zeus's wife, the Lamia fled and transformed herself into a creature who attacked other mother's children and drank their blood. In India, the vampire goddess Kali dates back to the 6th century. She was a creature with multiple arms, a necklace of skulls, and a mouth full of fangs which dripped blood. The concept of the vampire runs through almost every Asian culture. In Malaysia, the vampire was a being who would land near the cribs of babies and with its long, snake-like tongue, suck out their blood. Kappas were feared in Japan. These were blood-sucking monsters who hid in lakes and rivers, waiting to feast on passing travelers. And in China came the vampire Shang-Chi. Shang-Chi's were strong and vicious. Able to change into a wolf, they would rip the heads or limbs from their prey. In the Aztec culture of Mexico, a blood-drinking vampire bat god met unfortunate souls in the underworld. 
The Aztecs worshiped these flying mammals. Though they weigh no more than an ounce, in a year's time, a colony of 100 bats can consume a quantity of blood equivalent to draining an entire herd of 25 cows. It was evolutionist Charles Darwin who saw their blood drinking firsthand. He published the first European reports of the vampire bat in 1890, the year Stoker began his research for Dracula. In writing Dracula, Bram Stoker came across an important source of European vampire superstitions. It was a book called Land Beyond the Forest, the English translation of Transylvania. Now contained in the borders of present-day Romania, Transylvania was an isolated country, ringed by rugged mountains. Stoker discovered that stories of vampires had been told here for centuries. Since before the Middle Ages, gypsies and peasants told tales of the evil Nosferatu. These undead blood drinkers were human in appearance. Their bite could turn their victims into vampires like themselves. The vampire stories that originated in Transylvania were stories to explain the unexplainable. Up to Stoker's own time, death and disease were viewed here with ignorance and superstition. Disease hysterias were common. Those thought responsible were branded as vampires, even after they were dead and buried. When somebody was suspect, that they were doing some harm to the village or the villagers. They would open the casket, and in those days there was no embalming. And the very process of the decomposition of the body makes the faces bloat, so they look full. Some of the blood backs up from, the, from some of the internal organs, so it would be very natural for blood to appear around the mouth. And so, you know, Two and two is five. <laughs> oh, that, must, that person must have been out, you know, feeding upon the living. To ultimately ensure that the vampire could not return, the legend said that the corpse could be decapitated or burned. But there was another method Stoker found in his research that would become the image most identified with keeping the undead where they belong. One of the ways of dealing with the vampire was keeping it in the grave. And one of the ways you kept it in the grave was by pinning it to the ground with a stake. The idea was to keep the body in the ground. As these pagan folk tales began to spread throughout the rest of Christian Europe in the 1600s, Christian symbols were enlisted to fight the vampire. Christians did not necessarily believe in the legends of the Nosferatu, but if true, they'd best be ready. The stake to destroy the vampire should be made of oak, the wood from which the cross of Christ was supposedly made. Sacred artifacts like the crucifix should make them helpless. What Christianity could not defeat was the myth itself. Vampires were still blamed for plagues and epidemics. The stories became even more overwhelming when they were connected to people who had a real taste for blood. In combing through vampire lore, Bram Stoker discovered that truth was more gruesome than legend. Such was the case of Elizabeth Bathory, the Blood Countess. She was born in 1560 into one of Hungary's most powerful families. Her every wish was attended to by her many servants. But in 1604, the young female servants from Elizabeth's castle began to disappear. Some were found in the countryside, completely drained of blood. Local peasants were certain a vampire had invaded their village. The culprit was not a vampire. It was Mathery, a blood taker of a different kind. Basically, she seemed to have had a fetish about blood, believed that bathing in blood would keep her young, and she was a creature who feared growing old. <laughs> 
Her bloodlust continued for six years, over which time she tortured and murdered hundreds of young servant girls. Finally, Elizabeth began to run out of servants. Her crimes were discovered after she made the mistake of killing a young noblewoman. And uh, even some members of her own family were involved in the investigation of it. At her trial in 1611, a diary in Elizabeth's own handwriting was presented as evidence. In it, she had recorded the names of the women she slaughtered, over 650 in all. Convicted for her crimes, Elizabeth Bathory was walled up in a room in her own castle. With no windows or doors, and only a small opening for food and air, she remained there, without a drop of blood to bathe in, until her death three years later. As Stoker was about to discover, Elizabeth Bathory's crimes paled in comparison to the man whose appetite for blood was even more gruesome. As In Search of History continues, we'll encounter Stoker's greatest inspiration, the real-life blood drinker who murdered thousands and gave Dracula his name. As his research to write Dracula continued, Bram Stoker began to sketch out sections of his novel. Some elements did not survive. His own handwritten notes indicate he was going to call his book The Undead. His vampire was named Count Wampir. Other elements would remain intact. Stoker had already begun to make extensive use of the Transylvanian locations he learned so much about. Then he saw red. Stoker came across the accounts of a real blood drinker from Transylvania, a 15th century despot who was responsible for the murders of tens of thousands of innocent people, Vlad the Impaler. To Stoker, he would be an inhuman inspiration. For his vampire, Vlad would provide Stoker's character a historic bloodline and a new name, Dracula. In 1448, near the end of the Middle Ages, 17-year-old Transylvanian-born Prince Vlad began his first reign of Wallachia. It didn't last long. In Wallachia, being ruler was a short-term job. Within the borders of contemporary Romania and south of the Transylvanian Alps, Wallachia was a tiny country caught between two of history's mightiest forces. To the east and south, the Turks' Ottoman Empire was on the rise, aggressively pushing its way into Europe. It had just vanquished the Byzantine Empire. Constantinople, its capital, had fallen to the Turks only three years before. To the west and north was Christian Europe, whose leaders were beginning to fear that the Muslim Turks might conquer their empires as well. Wallachian territories were constantly changing hands. Turks frequently raided southern towns, despite alliances made with Wallachian leaders. Meanwhile, in the north, the Kingdom of Hungary struggled to gain control of the country. They also made deals with Wallachian leaders, or murdered them. The governor of Hungary, John Hunyadi, with the support of Wallachia's elite class, the Boyars, ordered the assassination of Vlad's father, the previous ruler of Wallachia. Then Vlad's brother, who was next in line to the throne, was blinded with red-hot iron stakes and buried alive. Young Vlad took control of the country, but for only two months. He could not consolidate his power and fled. Hungarian-backed Vladislav II became the new prince. Vlad desperately wanted to regain the throne, 
He wanted a Wallachia free of Hungarian and Turkish intervention. He wanted revenge for the murder of his father and brother. Over time, Wallachia's new prince, to the surprise of his anti-Turk Hungarian backers, adopted a pro-Turkish policy. After seven years in exile, Vlad was able to get enough support to confront Vladislav II, kill him, and regain the Wallachian throne. Now, the real terror began. In the spring of 1456, Prince Vlad, now 25 years old, began the second and longest of his rules. It was time for revenge. Vladislav II was dead, and Hungary's John Hunyadi had just died of the plague. This left the boyars to be dealt with. He had a special occasion planned for them. Here in Wallachia's capital of Tirgoviste, Prince Vlad held an inaugural celebration at his new palace. He invited 500 boyars, along with the region's five bishops. After a day of festivities, Prince Vlad ordered all his guests, their spouses, and their attendants impaled. Impalement is a lost art. It's where you stick somebody up on a stake or a pole. Somewhat like crucifixion. It's a terrible way to die. That's ruled by fear. Very effective. It's not very moral, but it, keeps, it kept people in line then. Prince Vlad was going to ensure his current reign lasted longer than his first. The innocent would be slaughtered along with the guilty. His victims would be left as examples for all to see. He would be known by a new name, Sepish, Romanian for Impaler. But the ultimate reputation of Vlad Sepish would be based on even greater acts of depravity. While he was dining amid his impaled victims, first he would have the blood from his victims gathered in bowls, then he would dip the bread in the blood and slurp it down, basically. This was the character that fascinated Bram Stoker, a real blood drinker. Then Stoker found that Vlad the Impaler had another name. He never signed his name Vlad the Impaler, or he never called himself that. Other people may call you the Impaler, but what do you say? Hi there, I'm Vlad the Impaler. Please, give me a break. The enemy calls you that, right? You don't call yourself that. He called himself Vlad Dracula. We have two documents surviving from Sibiu, which is a town in Transylvania, where he clearly had his name signed, Vlad Dracula. Vlad the Impaler was the real Dracula. It was a name he inherited from his father, who was christened into a special order to fight the Turks. His father was named Dracul, Vlad Dracul. And that was from the order of the dragon that was given to the father by the Holy Roman Emperor King Sigismund at Nuremberg in the year 1431. And the name Dracula, ah, is a, it's called an enclitic ending, like Ivan Ivanovich, you know, son of Ivan. Ivan. That, that means son of Dracul, means son of him who had the order of the dragon. The name so impressed Stoker, he changed his vampire character from Wampir to Dracula. When In Search of History returns, we'll learn about the bloody toll the real Dracula took on Wallachia, his shocking years in prison, and the mystery surrounding his death. Thanks to the invention of the movable type printing press in the mid-15th century, stories of Vlad the Impaler's reign of terror circulated throughout Europe. Some included his real name, Dracula. <laughs> 
A German pamphlet of the time teased readers with specifics from the real horror story to follow. Here begins a very cruel, frightening story about a wild, bloodthirsty man, Dracula. How he impaled people and roasted them, and with their heads boiled them in a kettle, and how he skinned people and hacked them into pieces like a head of cabbage. European leaders also read the accounts of Vlad's atrocities. Some, like Pope Pius II in Rome, did not approve of his methods, but realized Vlad's importance in holding back the tide of Muslim Ottoman expansion. By 1461, Dracula's rule encompassed Wallachia and several Transylvanian provinces. Prince Vlad continued to impale his political enemies at home, while his armies, with their guerrilla tactics, successfully attacked Turkish forces much greater in number. Before the year's end, Vlad boldly launched his largest assault against the Turks. Vlad's army of only 30,000 killed over 20,000 Turkish troops in a matter of months. Ottoman Sultan Mohammed II decided to fight back. In the spring of 1462, a full-scale invasion of Wallachia was begun. Prince Vlad was overwhelmed by an army of over 200,000, led by Mohammed II himself. As Vlad's army retreated northward, he left nothing for his enemies to inherit. He burned crops, destroyed livestock, poisoned wells, and set fire to towns. The Turks eventually pushed their way to Turgoviste. Vlad had left his deserted capital in ruins. Most shocking was the gruesome spectacle Vlad had made of his Turkish prisoners captured the year before. What appalled Mohammed the Conqueror was the forest of impaled surrounding Turgoviste where rotting cadavers had been left all summer half eaten by vultures and the Sultan allegedly said, and this is a document in Turkish sources, what can one do against a man who does such deeds? Stunned, Mohammed II left Wallachia with most of his army. But by now, Vlad the Impaler's days were numbered. Vlad fled with what remained of his army to Castle Dracula, his fortified stronghold at the foot of the Transylvanian Alps. Here, he made a last stand against a small Turkish force. Before the castle was overrun, he escaped through a secret passage and made his way into Transylvania. Vlad the Impaler's second reign of Wallachia was over. In his six years as ruler, he tortured and murdered over 40,000 innocent men, women, and children in a country whose population was only half a million. He killed an even greater number of Turks. Vlad was finally captured and imprisoned by the new king of Hungary, Matthias Corvinus, son of John Hunyadi. Vlad was held in this fortress tower on the grounds of the king's palace. But even in prison, Vlad the Impaler lived up to his name. While he was in prison, he couldn't give up his bad habits of impalement. Now, he couldn't get humans to impale anymore while he was in prison, so he had caught mice, and he would torture and, and impale them, and then he had his jailers buy him birds from the marketplace, and he would torture them and impale them. During Vlad's 12 years in prison, Wallachia had again fallen back into pro-Turkish hands. King Matthias was pressured by many of Christian Europe's leaders to release Vlad. The king made a deal with Dracula. In exchange for his freedom, 
Vlad pledged his loyalty to Matthias and converted to Roman Catholicism, renouncing his Orthodox faith. Vlad Dracula was freed from prison in 1475. With support from Matthias, Vlad made a third run at the Wallachian throne and took power a year later. This reign would last as long as his first. Finally, death caught up with the real Dracula. He was killed in December of 1476. Some accounts say he was assassinated by the country's remaining boyars, who could not conceive of another rule by Vlad the Impaler. Others say he was killed by the Turks in battle. In any event, his head was displayed to Mohammed II as proof that the hated Impaler was finally dead. Vlad Dracula's headless body was brought to a remote monastery near the town of Snogov. He had personally chosen the church here to be his final resting place. During his second reign, Prince Vlad built five such monasteries in Wallachia. Even though he regularly murdered religious leaders whom he didn't trust, he was still concerned about the salvation of his soul. But Dracula's evil soul could never be cleansed. Tradition has it that he was buried in a crypt right in front of the altar, so that when the priest would step over the grave during the liturgy, it would kind of absolve him of his many sins. The saga of the real Dracula does not die here. In 1931, an expedition led by the Romanian government excavated Dracula's tomb. But when that grave was opened up, the crypt stone taken off, casket and body were missing. Animal bones were found in the grave, not the bones of a human being. The real Dracula did survive the grave. Bram Stoker not only immortalized his name, he used his life in his novel. In the book, Dracula proudly talked about an ancestor from Transylvania. The description closely followed the real Dracula's fight against the Turks. Stoker's Dracula was complete with a bloodline that ran through all the history he discovered. Part myth in the vampire folklore of centuries past, and part fact in the form of Vlad the Impaler. Stoker's Dracula was the total vampire. When In Search of History continues, we'll discover how Romania today reveres Dracula as a national hero and learn the final fate of Bram Stoker. While Bram Stoker's Dracula became one of the most enduring works of modern literature, he never knew of its astonishing success. Number eight of the 17 books Stoker wrote, it never made any money in his lifetime. Immediately after its publication, Stoker produced a stage version of Dracula. It was a dismal failure. It opened and closed on the same night. In 1912, an exhausted Stoker died in obscurity and poverty at the age of 64. At his request, he was cremated, not buried. Ironically, it would be the stage that would resurrect Dracula. In 1927, a newly adapted version opened on Broadway. In it, Dracula lost his grotesque physical appearance and put on a tuxedo. This time, it was a resounding success. Its star was Bela Lugosi.
Lugosi starred in the film version four years later. Dracula would go on to become the most frequently adapted literary work in motion picture history. The 1992 version, directed by Francis Coppola, was a box office hit, grossing over $192 million worldwide. The image of Dracula was used to attract, not repel. It appeared on hundreds of consumer goods, from toys to snack foods. The book itself would become a phenomenon. Published around the world, the novel has been translated into over 50 languages. In Romania today, the real Dracula is still called Vlad Sepish in official government records. He is not looked on as a vicious tyrant, but as a national hero for his fight against the Turks. At the National Military Museum in Bucharest, a set of his armor is on display. In the Borgo Pass of Transylvania, where Bram Stoker's novel begins and ends, there is now the Hotel Castle Dracula. Inside, you can buy a fifth of homemade Dracula vodka. At its core, Dracula is more than a good horror story and more than the brutal prince of Wallachia. Bram Stoker wrote about raw human urges and desires that are shared by most. Dracula does everything we're told we cannot do these days. Dracula can freely expose himself to blood. Dracula can be as promiscuously sexual as he chooses. Dracula has wealth, power, eternal youth, instant hypnotic control over the opposite sex or the same sex. A castle in Europe, a great wardrobe, and it's the American dream. The price Stoker's Dracula paid for his power was great, but the allure of that power is one that will haunt mankind forever, the one that can be found in the darkest corners of our hearts. That's why the story of Dracula will never die. That's what Bram Stoker discovered when he went in search of history. On December night in 1431, this Transylvania fortress town saw the birth of one of the most terrifying figures in history. He was christened Dracula, and he unleashed a reign of terror on the country we now call Romania. His name became a byword for cruelty. Hundreds of years later, his exploits inspired the greatest horror story of our age, that of Count Dracula, the blood-drinking vampire. The real Dracula died in battle in 1476. This is the story of an American family who for generations have lived in his shadow. They are related to him by marriage and are the direct descendants of his most bitter enemy, Vintela Florescu. Over the years, their investigations into Dracula resulted in misfortune, fear, and tragedy. At times, it even seemed like they were the victims of some kind of curse. <laughs> 
Now, to confront these memories, they have returned to Romania to trace their family history back to its violent beginnings and revisit those places where their ancestors met Dracula face to face. Their journey provides us with a unique insight into the man and the myth that was Dracula. This is the elegant street of Bucharest, where each person tried to have a house that was more ambitious than the other, and the styles varied enormously. These are the direct descendants of the family who crossed swords with Dracula. Dad, isn't this where your house, where you were born, right, it, right here? This uh, is the house where I lived as a young child with my aunt. I used to play tennis there. Historian Radu Florescu is the man who revealed the real Dracula to the world in a historical bestseller published in 1972. But the family connection with Dracula goes back much further. His ancestor, Vintila Florescu, led a revolt against Dracula. More recently, his uncle George was the man who discovered Dracula's tomb. And in the previous generation, Dimitri Florescu spent years hunting the missing portrait of Dracula. Today, Radu Florescu and his son, John, want to trace their connection to Dracula back to its origins. This has brought them to the Patriarch's Palace in Bucharest. The Patriarch of Romania is the head of the country's Orthodox Church. The Florescus are here to tell him about their plans. In particular, they want to find a remote and run-down monastery where they believe their earliest ancestors are buried. The Patriarch blesses their mission, a big help in gaining access and cooperation. And there is another place the Florescus have to visit. Radu spent 15 years tracking down the real Dracula. And during that time, one particular place came to dominate his research. The castle that Dracula built in the Transylvanian Alps at Poyanar. It is a castle that Radu Florescu refuses to enter again. It was here that his uncle, George Florescu, fell and later died from his injuries. And here that his son, John, spent the most terrifying night of his life. The castle was built in 1457 by prisoners captured in battle. Those unfit for labor were impaled on wooden stakes. From then on, Dracula was known as Vlad Tepes, Vlad the Impaler. But all his proclamations used the name he had been given at birth, Dracula, signed in blood red letters. It means son of the dragon because his father he had been invested in the Order of the Dragon, whose mission was to conduct crusades against the Protestant heretics and mostly against the Turks. As to what Dracula looked like, there is little evidence. His grandfather and uncle, princes before him, stare down from the walls of this remote monastery, their names in Greek beside them. But for Dracula, we have only this portrait and this description by the papal legate to Hungary, who met him face to face in 1464. He was not very tall, but very stocky and strong, with a cold and terrible appearance. Very long eyelashes framed large, wide open green eyes. The bushy black eyebrows made them appear threatening. In the 15th century, Romania was divided into many small kingdoms, organized along military lines, and each with its own fortified churches and castles. It was a rich land with busy trading centers like the walled city of Brasov, and a tempting target for the Muslim Turks who were trying to invade Europe from the east. Dracula swiftly became the greatest block to their ambitions. He represented in the 15th century a vivid symbol uh, of the fight 
against the Turkish invasion. Uh, if you prefer a kind of crusader defending the Christendom uh, against the uh, Muslims. And in such a way, he became a kind of modern hero in art, in literature. I must confess, for me, he is a hero. But this crusader had a darker side. In Romanian, Dracula means not just the dragon, but the devil. In religious art, when St. George slew the dragon, he was also slaying the devil. And to his enemies, Vlad Tepes was a devil. His capital, Tirgoviste, was the scene of his greatest atrocity. As a Turkish army advanced on the city, they were brought to a halt by the sight of thousands of captives whom Vlad had skewered on wooden stakes, turning the valley floor into a forest of the impaled. German pamphleteers claimed that he liked to dine among the festering corpses and drank their blood. And that once, when a nobleman complained about the smell, Vlad impaled him on a very long stake, saying, you live up there where the stench cannot reach you. He did what he had to do in, this, in his period of time. He tried to put a little bit of order in his country, which is nothing to blame. Uh, the punishments he, he provided for his uh, enemies were not very unusual for that uh, times. Vlad was a great monarch, strong and cruel, it's true, but a very good one. And uh, don't forget, he lived, Vlad Sepes lived in the same uh, age, in the same century, with uh, the famous English king, Richard III. Richard III has gone down in history as a murderer. But like Vlad, the worst stories about him were written by his rivals. These pictures were drawn by his enemies, German invaders. Many believe the legend of the blood-drinking Dracula probably has its origins in these images, rather than in hard fact. And so his terrifying reputation spread, such as the story of how when Genoese ambassadors refused to remove their caps, Dracula nailed them to their heads. But as a key defender of Christian lands against the Muslim invaders, he had the support of the church. And there were the romantic tales of night attacks and close escapes. Most famous of all was the story of how Dracula's young wife faced a Turkish attack on Castle Dracula. Fearing that there was no escape, she raced through the castle and onto the battlements, from which she flung herself into the valley below. But Dracula had already made good his escape along a secret passageway and then rode off on a horse, which had its shoes nailed on backwards to trick his pursuers. But in the winter of 1476, he finally met his end at the hands of his Turkish enemies. His head was cut off, taken back to Constantinople, and impaled on a stake. He was 45. But Dracula's death birthed a legend, a legend that would sweep through Europe. The chilling tale of his bloody rule would be reinforced by the folk beliefs of the Carpathian villagers. In the buried body that did not decay and became the undead, the vampire, Vlad the Impaler would become Count Dracula, the blood-drinking demon who could not die. And over the centuries, the Florescues would also find themselves caught up in his menacing and violent story. The Florescues were part of the tiny circle of wealthy nobles known as boyars. Vintilla Florescu arranged a marriage between his sister Maria and Dracula's half-brother, Vlad the Monk, 
and then supported his attempt to overthrow Dracula and become prince himself. But the uprising failed, and both Vlad the Monk and Florescu were forced to flee. The Florescu's and Dracula were now bitter enemies. The Florescu's are as old as the country itself. And we are, I think, and I think most of the genealogists agree, the oldest family in Romania. Wisely, both Vlad the Monk and Maria Florescu retired to a monastic life. Their bloodline finally died out in the 19th century, outlasting Dracula's by a hundred years. But the bloodline of Vintilla Florescu, Dracula's most hated enemy, ran on for 500 years to the present day, and Radu, his son John, and grandson, Vlad. The history of the Florescu family is intimately mixed with the Romanian history, is part of it. And uh, on five centuries, you find at every epoch, really, uh, one or several members of the family. But the people of those times left no writings and few portraits. Finding physical evidence of these earliest ancestors would not be easy. But through the church, John has managed to find the monastery, one of the oldest in Romania, where the first Florescus are said to be buried. He visited it with historian Stefan Andrescu. The monastery was being heavily renovated, but behind the scaffolding, things looked promising. Could these faded frescoes be the faces of his medieval family? So, and this is uh, basically where the stones were laid inside the church. I guess. Yes, so that's right. Right. I see the priest and, uh, but the priest tells them that although Florescu's are buried here, their tombstones have been removed and their graves covered over with planks. What he was saying is that this goes back just about to Dracula's time. Because of the renovations, the stones have been moved to another part of the grounds and stored under a nearby hut, and a lot of muscle power is going to be needed to get them out. On here, yeah, you know, once we get it out. Okay, that's good. Okay, so last century, it was possible to read. Okay, so you can see the inscriptions. Okay. Okay, put it over there. Okay. Uh, here is uh, an inscription in alphabetic, Cyrillic alphabetic, right. uh, and in Slavonic yes. language. Uh, it means uh, at the beginning uh, there is a cross, and after, here lies Jupan Dregic uh, Florescu, uh, the slave of God. He lived uh, at the end of uh, 15th uh, century and the beginning of uh, 16th century. So is in the same time uh, with uh, uh, Dracula and uh, Dregic. It was uh, one of the most uh, high official uh, at the princely court. Right. Dragic was the son of Vintilla Florescu, Dracula's bitter rival. This is the oldest Florescu tombstone found to date. There's a monastery right over there, yes. the three towers. It's how old is it? It's about older than Dracula. When Dracula was killed, his head was believed to have been taken to Constantinople and his body buried on the island monastery of Snagov. During his lifetime, he turned it into a fortress and imprisoned and murdered some of his rivals here. 
Legend has it that he hid his treasure here by dropping it to the bottom of the lake. And it is here that the fate of the Florescu family once again met that of Dracula. 70 years ago, Radu Florescu's uncle, George, made this same boat journey across the lake. Romanian history was George's passion. My uncle was an extraordinary man. He was the only gentleman in Bucharest who dressed like a 19th century aristocrat. I could imagine his dress was fashionable in Victorian England. Garters and all, monocle, a little medal. He was the director of the History Museum in Bucharest. And uh, he was not a professional historian, but he wrote far better books than almost any professional historian. According to folklore, Dracula was buried in the monastery, but no one knew where. George Florescu determined to be the first to find the tomb, open it, and look upon Dracula's remains. In the summer of 1931, he began his search at Snagov. This is one of the most important moments in Uncle George's life. He was waiting for this to uncover the tomb that you see right in front of us, where, according to tradition, Dracula was supposed to lay at rest when the tomb was opened. They found, to their utter amazement, no casket, just the bones of oxen and other animals. George then searched the rest of the church and found a similar tomb, in a strange place, just inside the doorway. We suspect when this monastery came in the hands of Greek monks who did not like Dracula and did not want him sitting so close to God, and so the Greek abbot of the time said, let him rest there where the people and the peasants can trample over his unworthy remains. With the help of a colleague, George managed to lever open the heavy stone lid of the tomb and had only seconds to peer inside before the air and strong sunlight rushed in to destroy the contents. George told me that when opening the coffin, uh, he saw the whole body intact in the light of a late summer day. and. Uh, he could see it disintegrating under his eyes, but he saw he was dressed in purple. He had all kinds of jewels. In those few seconds, George also saw that the face of the corpse was covered by a handkerchief, something Matei Kazaku questioned him about later. I asked him, did the body had a head? And he said, uh, well, I think, because uh, he had this handkerchief on his face. That means it was a head. And then I said, well, but historically, it is known that Dracula was beheaded and his head sent to Istanbul. And George was uh, quite puzzled because this body was not Dracula if he possessed a head. But after years, I discovered that the Turks used to sculp the heads. They had a, a, a brilliant technique to take out the, the, the skin, all the skin of the, 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 the head with hair and face, and then uh, conserve it with all kinds of uh, spices. So Dracula could be buried with a skull without the skin. And that explains the need of a handkerchief, because without the skin on your face, uh, it must have been something like uh, dreadful. Shortly after Dracula's burial, a terrible storm destroyed the adjoining chapel, which fell into the lake. Locals still claim they can hear the bells tolling beneath the waves. But the great oak doors of Snagov Chapel 
floated on the water to a nearby village. They survived today, one of the great artistic wonders of the age of Dracula. George Florescu had fulfilled a dream and gazed upon the corpse of Dracula. But this merely stimulated him to further research. Above all, he wanted to locate and visit Vlad the Impaler's long forgotten mountain fortress. His quest would lead to Dracula's castle and frightening events that some would claim with a curse of Dracula. All that remains of Dracula's castle are these ruined battlements on a mountaintop. Yet when George Florescu had the chance to visit it in 1969, along with Radu, his son John, and some friends, he saw it as the culmination of a life's work. He decided he would like to go to the castle. I think he just liked the idea of this detective hunt. At that time, Castle Dracula was not yet well recognized by anyone. It was an abandoned old thing that no one knew much about. And we climbed up along a winding path which led all the way up. The Florescus were accompanied by Romanian Dracula researcher Matei Kazaku. I uh, said, and uh, like a joke, but when uh, Vlad built this castle, it was like a kind of curse against his enemies, never to climb into it, never to, to come alive to the castle. Maybe you, as a descendant of this noble family, you were under the curse. And he was very afraid, because he was a very religious man, uh, George Florescu. The younger members of the family led the ascent up the mountain. Then, within sight of the summit, George slipped and fell down the mountainside. He was carried down to a local hospital, but died some months later. So we all said, well, this must be Dracula's curse. There were several things everybody will tell you, each of us had his uh, accidents, his incidents, his moments of pain, of, uh, of fear. Radu was deeply unsettled by these events and convinced that all was not what it seemed at the castle. He returned a few months later, in the winter of 1969, to carry out a proper investigation in the company of young filmmaker Myron Yara. It was cold, cold, cold. In fact, uh, in the Russian car, which was uh, given to uh, the camera team, uh, there was no heater, and instead we had furs in the back seat. My impression at the time was that we were in the presence of a great deal of power. Not necessarily good or evil, but that this was an extraordinary place. Down in the village uh, below, the birds were uh, twittering away and uh, there was a great deal of ambient noise. Arriving in the vicinity of the castle, as you can hear right now, there is complete silence. Not the sound of a bird, not the sound of a dog barking, nothing. During filming on that first trip, Myron doubled over with stomach pains. He was rushed to a hospital and then flown home to Boston, where he was diagnosed with internal bleeding. I was taken to the Mass General Hospital and I had some uh, internal bleeding which eventually cleared up. There was no clear diagnosis. As soon as he was released, he took his film to be developed. But within hours, the lab called to say the film was damaged. Some of the footage was fine. The rest of the footage, mostly the Transylvania uh, footage of the castle had a milky quality to it. Something had interfered with the film and uh, we never really uh, had a definitive answer. Now Radu has returned to Castle Dracula, but has no desire to revisit the ramparts. <laughs> 
Growing up, the castle was perhaps the most frightening thing I experienced. There was something uh, eerie at that site. I'd have headaches, suddenly. I don't put garlics or courses in my pocket, but I have a certain reluctance to go there, and I cannot explain it to you rationally. Back in 1972, the death of his great uncle George and his own father's misfortunes convinced John Florescu that there was some malevolent force at work in the castle. Together with school friend Steve Keefe, he decided to spend a night at the castle. Now, 30 years later, he and Steve are back to meet up with old memories. You know, it was around here where uh, my father called. His Uncle George had fallen. He'd fallen down there. And he yelled to me to come. And uh, I went down. So Uncle George never made it, even though he was four-fifths away here. We chose the date of July 14th, 1972, because we wanted to uh, have a full moon so we could see what was going on. We rigged up the castle with lights, tape recorder and camera and with flash, and thinking that we may uh, actually see something uh, paranormal that might back up uh, that there was something unusual about this castle. We laid out our sleeping bags and we decided to alternate one up, one sleeping, one up, one sleeping. We were actually sleeping in that tower right there, mm -hmm. and we are looking out toward the plains. But a little past midnight, we saw a beam from a fixed source of light, as if it was being pulled by a cable. I said, you know, there's something here. At first, we thought it was local people, perhaps, carrying a lantern to check on, on us. But as it approached and got closer, we realized it, it was a reddish color, and we began to become a little bit more afraid. I yelled to it in Romanian, you know, who are you, what are you? And just when the light got into the clearing, the light went out. We came with the expectation that something could happen. But when something did happen, we were quite overcome with the fear. And this is what, I, what we didn't really expect, to the point where when we left in the morning, uh, we, were, we were glad to leave and uh, felt that we had uh, uh, witnessed something uh, of, a, of a paranormal experience. I believe a sense of evil lingers uh, around Castle Dracula. Too many dramas unfolded there, too many crimes, too many dark scenes uh, took place there. So I, 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 felt, I felt something uh, uh, evil. Over the years, the story of Dracula's rule was reinforced by local superstition. Transylvania was home to those who believed in vampires. In 1897, an Irishman named Bram Stoker would immortalize the memory of Dracula and the myth of the vampire to spectacular effect. Much of the evil we associate with the name of Dracula as a blood-sucking vampire is due to the character created by Bram Stoker in his 19th century bestseller, for young people today, uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula is the, is the most important than Vlad Tsepes. It's pity uh, that uh, history is not preferred to such a legend, but uh, it's true. Stoker's creation was in fact an amalgam of the folk memory of Dracula and the very real beliefs of the farmers and mountain people of Romania. They believed in the existence of what they called the undead. These were people who had been buried, but whose bodies did not decay. According to this belief, such people became vampires and would rise from their graves at night to attack the living. <laughs> 
Sometimes only a fine line separated these beliefs from church ritual. Matej Kazaku's father was an Orthodox priest. In the Romanian Orthodox Church, there is a custom to unearth the dead after three years, maximum after seven years. And this is a very old custom. It is known from the Middle Ages. And the idea was to see, to confirm that the, the corpse was totally rotten, that is, in the mentality of the church and of the people, that the soul and the body were separated. People believed doing that can help the dead for the last judgment. The soul was in the sky or in purgatorium or somewhere else, and the body could return to the earth. And so my father was asked by people to do this ceremony. Uh, so uh, they went to the cemetery. The coffin was dug out, and uh, then the bones were taken out. They were washed with a special oil, put in a clean linen sheet, and uh, buried again. There is a definite parallel between this belief and the beliefs in the vampires. That is, the dead are undead. Even today, traditions concerning the burial of the dead echo these beliefs. A dead man will be at risk of becoming a vampire if he leaves the house feet first. For those who catch his gaze as he is carried out, will follow him to the grave. Or if a cat or dog crosses his path on the way to the cemetery, then he may join the ranks of the undead. In general, country folk avoid talking about vampires because they signify evil, and that leads to fear. But there have been other cases when an entire village has talked about the vampires with such conviction that the researchers themselves were convinced and frightened. And at night, they hung garlic at the windows and door to protect themselves. It's true. In some uh, mountainous, remote areas, the funeral beliefs are present with some uh, supernatural beings and some old uh, customs survived. But they are not vampires. They are connected to ceremonies, to burials, to marriage, to birth, and so on. One of these old customs provides an eerie parallel to the tradition of the blood-drinking vampire. There is a long list of ways to protect against the vampire, but these things are extremely rare nowadays. You may still come across such things in some out-of-the-way places. In some remote villages, the dead person would be dug up, the heart of the vampire would be removed, and then boiled and dissolved in wine. And people believed to have been infected by the vampire would have to drink it. <laughs> there used to be people in certain villages who would be specially paid to carry out this operation. People do believe in vampires in Romania. My grandfather died in 1947. And in 1983, when my own father died, he was buried in the same tomb. And I wasn't present. My brother, who lives in Bucharest, was there. And he told me he had a terrible shock when seeing his grandfather, whom he had seen in 1947 as a young boy, uh, buried, uh, appear perfectly uh, in a perfect state of conservation, you know? As it, uh, and uh, it, then it uh, decayed, it was rotten in some minutes. But in the 17th century, he would have been considered a vampire. Bram Stoker fused the memory of Vlad the Impaler with Romanian folk traditions. Such was his success that for much of the 20th century, the real Dracula became lost amid myths of vampires and the undead.
It would not be until the 1960s that he would find an unlikely rescuer. Nicolae Ceaușescu, Romanian president and head of one of Eastern Europe's most repressive regimes, would turn him into a national hero. Most of Radu Florescu's early research was carried out under the gaze of Nicolae Ceaușescu's ruthless regime. Romania was now a police state, and Ceaușescu was determined that his legacy would be that of Romania's heroic leader in the mold of Vlad the Impaler. Ceaușescu's newfound interest in Dracula meant research was a risky business with heavy political overtones. Radu and his colleagues were making quiet and steady progress until their work was revealed to the wider world during a visit by U.S. President Richard Nixon. Our embassy was short of staff, so the ambassador gave me the task of being a kind of go-between man for the press corps. There were about, I don't know, 200 American journalists at that time. One journalist asked me, what are you doing here, Professor Floresco? And I said, I'm researching Dracula. And that was the explosion. Suddenly, headlines all over Europe, all over the US. We were scared stiff. I mean, we had not even begun writing a single line. And you know, scholars don't write that fast. A journalist can do the job much quicker. With a slip of the tongue, the Dracula hunters found themselves the hunted. The cultural attaché came to us and said that our apartment was bugged. And would we want to have it debugged? He said it was unconscionable for a scholar to be watched like that. And I refused the help he offered. I said it would make them all the more suspicious. I was not doing anything. I was not spying for the CIA. I was just a scholar doing research at that time on Dracula. So he did not come and the bug stayed in. We knew that the lady at the gate of the apartment, that she would make a report to the Securitate. And at the end of my stay, I said, uh, Maria, are you a member of the security? And she said, Putsin, which means a little. 1976 was the 500th anniversary of Dracula's death and Ceausescu decided to use the occasion as a way of linking himself with his national hero. He demanded that Vlad's face appear on a special issue of postage stamps. And in a surprising move, even commissioned political dissident Matei Kazaku to write a popular history of his hero. I was lucky because Ceausescu uh, was interested in history, started to interest himself in the Romanian history and he needed strong heroes. That was for me beneficial, the fact that Ceausescu and the Romanian authorities thought that Vlad, Dracula, the Impaler, could be a national asset for, uh, for tourism and well, for the image of Romania. So I was protected, so to say, by, Dr by Dracula. But strangest of all was the way in which Dracula's life was reflected in Ceausescu's final hours. All over Eastern Europe in 1989, popular revolutions toppled the communist regimes. It was only in Romania that things ended in bloodshed. As the end drew near, Ceausescu's heavily loaded helicopter staggered off the roof of his presidential palace. He could have made a bid for freedom in any direction, but instead, he flew to his lakeside residence at Schneidhof, where Dracula was buried, and then took off again, only to land at Turgoviste, Dracula's capital. There, where so many had been impaled to die slowly in agony, his death by firing squad was quick. Well, he finished just like Dracula, like his hero. <laughs> so uh, I think there is some uh, eternal justice. Ceausescu was the first to appreciate the potential power of Dracula as a national icon. Today, the legend is central to Romania's tourist industry. The emblem of the Order of the Dragon hangs outside the house where he lived as a young boy, and the town where he was born, the perfect medieval village of Sigishwara, is one of Romania's top tourist destinations.
and a huge Dracula theme park is to be built near the hilltop fortress of Rajnosh. But Castle Dracula is too inaccessible to be on the tourist trail and lacks the allure of a medieval town. But at long last, the Florescues hope to make their peace with it. The castle has long been a place of fear for the local villagers and the source of supernatural stories. Now, in response to the family's request, the priests from the nearby monastery have come to bless the site. They attempted to climb to the castle the day before, but were driven back by a fierce thunderstorm. Now, instead, they perform their ceremony a thousand feet below the castle walls, where Dracula's wife plunged to her death over 500 years ago. In there, that's what the priest was telling us, right? Yes, yes. The most but has uh, revisiting the places where the fate of his family has been entangled with that of Dracula enabled John Florescu to place past events in clearer perspective? Okay. When I saw those tombstones, I watched as the kids wiped off the dust with those rags. He lies as a slave of God. I thought of these ancestors as individuals. They lived in Dracula's time. They had the courage to fight him. Then, because of the fact that a Florescu married into Dracula's family, that one of my ancestors tried to seize power from Dracula, or we, my father, my great uncle, or I, we've been too curious, we've had misfortune. This place, there's something to it. There's a darkness about the place. So, am I a little suspicious of it? Yeah. Would I come back and visit it? Yes, I would. Would I spend another night or taunt or play with it? I don't think it's worth it. In life, Dracula was a champion against Muslim invaders. In legend, he captivated the imagination of a dictator. In storybook fiction, he became a blood-drinking vampire. And his chilling memory inspired a family to hunt for his and their own origins. Meanwhile, today's Romanians have come to terms with Vlad Tepes, Vlad the Impaler, Dracula. The merciless tyrant has become Romania's favorite son.